Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about this problem of overfitting, which was where we left off last week. So we're going to see how we can estimate the true error of our model, so not just the error we measure on our training set, but the error we expect there to be when we use our model for real with new data. And we're going to see how we can avoid overfitting, either by selecting the, the best model or the best hypothesis class, so to avoid uh, using something that is too powerful for our data, or with regularization, which is to change the way we train the, the, the model, the way we find the best hypothesis, in order to reduce overfitting. <coughs> well, first, let's start with the, uh, the problem we saw in last lecture, which was we were fitting uh, a model, that is, the, the model represents a hypothesis class. We're going to try to find the best hypothesis for our data. So we used optimization. We saw this with linear regression. We want to find the most likely parameters for our model. That is a maximum likelihood, uh, the optimization we wanted to do. And this turned out to be the same as minimizing the quadratic error between our predictions and uh, the values we wanted to predict. So we, and we saw that we could go to higher dimensions, expand our data set. We, we build more powerful models with more parameters. But at some point, uh, this may be uh, giving us the, the wrong answer. So if we start with a straight line, with the, the, a simpler model, we cannot adjust very well our data. If we increase the dimensions by adding those nonlinear uh, combinations of features to our data, we can have, uh, for example, a degree three polynomial that fits our data better, but we can keep on doing that and increasing the power of our model. So in this case, we have a polynomial of degree 15, which fits very well our data, but gives us some suspicious results that probably it's fitting too much on the noise and then it generalizes poorly when it finds new data. So the problem is how can we choose which is the best model? For that we need to try to estimate the error. So the, the objective here is to find some function uh, this is uh, the one we're trying to represent with each of our models, which, given some parameters to specify exactly the function, once we input some value x, we can predict that value y. We're going to do that. We're going to adjust those parameters based on some training set, but we want to predict values outside that training set. So for all the possible universe of data we may find, we want to predict the correct value. We can measure the error in this set that we know, in the training set, because we can actually predict the values and compare with the values that we know. However, this is not the important set for which we want to predict the values, because these ones we already know. So the training error, we can measure it and use it to, to adjust our parameters, but it's not a good indicator of the error for, for uh, new examples, because we are only measuring it on the known examples, and we adjusted all the parameters in order to minimize that error. So if we minimize too much the error with a model that is too powerful, we may be starting to increase the error we're going to make when predicting new parameters. For example, we can see that here. This prediction for, for x values around 1 is probably very wrong because this is completely outside the pattern our data is making. So we adjusted too much on the data, and now we're making incorrect predictions outside the data. So this is the problem here. We need to estimate uh, the error that we're going to make when we introduce new data. So we need to measure error outside our training set, outside the set of points we use to adjust the parameters of the model. So we can do that, and we can split our data into two sets, into a training set, the, the blue points there, which we use to uh, optimize the, the parameters, minimize the quadratic error, and find the best hypothesis. But we, while we're doing that, we are not using these points in red. These we leave out. We don't use them to adjust the parameters, and we use them only to measure the error. And this is the test set 
that we're going to use. We use the trading set to find, to find the parameters and then the test set to obtain an estimate of the error. And if we do it like this, this, this is an unbiased estimate of the true error because we are using points that are outside the training set. One thing to remember is that this is an estimate. This is not actually the measure of the true error because to measure the true error we would have to go through all the possible points and measure the error over all of them. We are estimating the true error by using the test set as a random sample of the points that are outside the training set and using the error we measure on that sample as an estimate of what the real error would be. And one thing to remember is that depending on how we split at random the training and the test set, we obtain different points in the training set, so slightly different curves, and different estimates of the test set, uh, of the true error. So the test error is a random estimate of the true error because we are estimating on a random sample of all the possible points outside. However, it is an unbiased estimate of the true error. So if we repeated this thousands of times, we would have a measure like this of the test error. So these are the, the empirical measures of the test error by keeping some points outside. The true error should be somewhere around here. So we, are, we have a distribution that is around the true error. It's, not, it's random, sometimes it's above the true error, sometimes it's below the true error, but it's not biased. It not, it's not does not tend to be always above or, or more often above or more often below. So remember this, when we measure outside the training set, the test set, we have an estimate of the true error obtained from a random sample of the points that we did not use to train. So this is just an estimate, it's a random uh, value, but it's distributed around the true error, so it's not biased. If we do it like that, we have an unbiased estimate of what the true error will be. So this is basically what we have here. The training error is the, uh, the error we measure on the training set while we minimize our error to try to fine-tune our parameters. Obviously, this is not a good estimate of the true error because we are on purpose minimizing that error. And since we are adjusting the parameters to minimize that error, we will have something that is very biased towards lower values. That's why we leave the test set outside the training set, so we have an unbiased estimate of the true error. However, this test set is only a random sample of the points that could come later, and so does not tell us exactly what the true error is. We cannot measure the true error because that would be for all the possible points, but it gives us an, an unbiased estimate of what the true error will be. The true error will be the error if we could put all infinite possible points through our model and measure the error for all of them. The generalization error is the difference between the training error and the true error. So you can see that as we are using uh, models that are, that are more powerful, we start to increase the generalization error because we are reducing the training error but increasing the, the true error of, uh, of our apply. And this is what we see in overfitting. So imagine that we're trying to do this linear regression with, with polynomials of increasingly higher degree. This on the x-axis is the degree of the polynomial, so the degree 1 is a straight line, a quadratic curve, and so forth. We are increasing the degree of the polynomial. The blue line here is the training error, so the error we are, uh, the residual error after fitting our parameters. And as we increase the degree of the polynomial, the training error decreases. It becomes easier to adjust to the point, and so the difference between the line and the point starts to decrease. But at some point here, this is the test error, this is the error measured outside our uh, training set. The test error also starts decreasing, but at some point it starts to increase. And this is uh, the problem with overfitting. So here we see an increase in the generalization error, a big difference between the error within our training set and the error outside in the test set. So we can see two different uh, uh, stages here. We have this underfitting stage where the problem, the error comes from our model not being able to adjust to the data. So if the points are spread out in a curve and we try to adjust them with a straight line, we have a high training error and a high test error because the model cannot fit the shape of the data. As we increase the power of the model to adjust to the shape of the data, both errors decrease 
because we can adjust to the data in the training set and so the training error reduces, diminishes and we are also adjusting to the overall shape of the data so the test error also decreases. But at some point here we start having, so this is an example of underfitting <coughs> where the model cannot uh, adequately fit the, the shape of the data but at some point around here we start having a different problem. The training error keeps on diminishing because the more power we give to our, to our model the best, better it will fit the, the data but then outside the data we are using for training errors accumulate so the generalization error which is the difference between the two increases and the true error is also increasing very rapidly and this uh, is what happens here so in this case for example we adjusted this line to these points but this point here on the test set is, it has this value but it's predicted to have a, a much larger value so here at some point the, the error uh, becomes very large so this is what happens in overfitting when the model is too powerful and starts adjusting to, to noise instead of the, the actual shape of the data so basically overfitting we can see it happening when the generalization error starts to increase and this means that even though we are decreasing the training error we are increasing the true error of uh, our prediction now what can we do to try to uh, solve this problem to try to fit the data but at the same time not overfit the data not have this, uh, this problem of increasing the generalization error we can see that not all models have the same uh, balance of this problem. So some of them are underfitting, they don't fit the data well, some of them fit too well. One way of minimizing this problem is to choose the right model or choose the right hypothesis class. So if we go somewhere around here at uh, degree 5, we are minimizing the, the error outside our training set, so this seems to be uh, the best choice for our model. So this is something we could do. We use a set of points outside our training set to select the best model. But the problem is that if we use the test set to select the best model, now the test set is no longer able to give us an unbiased estimate of the true error because we are using that one to select the best model by selecting the one which gives us a lower value for the test error. This is something that sometimes uh, causes a bit of confusion but it's important to understand that if we choose this model because it has a degree 5, because it has the lowest test error, what we are doing now is we are favoring those that by chance, by random sampling, happen to give us the lowest test error. So now that test error would no longer be uh, an unbiased estimate of the true error. To illustrate this, uh, suppose we have something that has this distribution. This would be the, the random distribution of the test error measured when we take a random sample of points outside our training set and measure the error. Since this random sample sometimes will fall close to our line, sometimes farther away, we have this random distribution of what our, our measured error could be. But since we are not doing anything with that value, it's an unbiased estimator in the sense that on average it will tend to go closer and closer to the true error. But now suppose that we take 10 random samples, measure the error from those and choose the lowest error. And then we repeat that. We take 10 random samples, choose the lowest error, 10 random samples, the lowest error and so on. If we plot that we get this distribution here. Because since we are always, always taking 10 random samples and picking the one with the lowest error, and if we do that, if that is our procedure, then that error value that we end up with is no longer unbiased. It's, it's no longer on average around the true error. It's far below the true error because we, always, we are always deliberately choosing uh, the lowest value for the error. So this is something we have to bear in mind. If we, ch if we use some value, for example, the training error to try to fit the parameter, or uh, uh, measure error outside the training set to choose the best model, we are biasing that estimate because we are always trying to choose the lowest error. And if we take several random samples and choose the lowest, if we repeat that process, we get a distribution that is not, does not fit with the, uh, on average with the true error. 
So if we use the points outside the training set to choose the best model, that error value will no longer be the test error, will no longer be a true, uh, an unbiased estimate of the true error. So what we need to do is to actually split our, training, our data into three sets. We use the training set to fit the parameters. We keep a test set to the end uh, with which we don't do anything during the process. That one is only to have an unbiased estimate of the true error. So if we want to know uh, whether or not our final hypothesis works okay or have a, a, an idea of the true error of our final hypothesis, we need to keep this test set completely outside all the process and never use it to make any decision. To choose the best model, we use this validation set. This is a set of points that we are not going to use to fit the, the parameters of the model to find the best hypothesis, but we are going to use to estimate for each model what the true error should be. And for each model, the validation set will give us this validation error that, I that is an unbiased estimate of the true error. But it's unbiased for each model. When we take several models and pick the one with the lowest value, because we are choosing the one with the lowest value, now that one will no longer be unbiased, because we are biasing it towards lower values. So basically, the training set will be used to fit the parameters. The validation set we can use to select which is the best hypothesis. And then the test set at the end to get an unbiased estimate of the true error. We're going to see next week a better way of doing this. But uh, at this point, I just want you to have this clear idea of this separation and why we need to distinguish between the validation set and the test set. Because we are using the validation set to select the best model, and that validation error, because we are choosing the, the smallest one, will no longer be an unbiased estimate of the true error. So if we want an unbiased estimate of the true error, we need to have some points left out that we are not going to use for any decision, and those will give us this uh, unbiased estimate of the true error. Another uh, approach to reducing overfitting is to use regularization. So we saw uh, the choosing the, the lowest validation error. That is model selection. We pick the model or the hypothesis class that seems to minimize overfitting. Another possibility is, instead of trying to select uh, the best model, we change the learning algorithm, we change the function we're trying to optimize in order to try to reduce the effect of overfitting. For example, we can use this ridge regression in this case. This is the, the quadratic error that we want to minimize here. So we have the difference between the value we want, we want to predict and the value predicted by our function squared. We sum that up for all the training sets. So this would be the least mean squares minimization we saw so far. But we had, we had this uh, other term, which is the sum of the squares of all our coefficients. And this multiplied by a scaling factor. So the larger the scaling factor, the more weight this will have on, the, on our function, on our opti function we want to optimize. And the reason this tries to keep the model simpler is that it tries to uh, push all the coefficients towards zero, as close to zero as possible. Because uh, otherwise, if they go far from zero, these terms become large and there is a large penalty. So basically, with ridge regression, we are trying to fit our data as, as well as possible by minimizing the, the sum of the quadratic errors, but at the same time, trying to keep the coefficients of our model as small as possible. So trying to, uh, to prevent the line from curving too much and, and keeping it a bit straighter. This is an example of trying to fit this data with uh, the, the blue line. This is a, a polynomial of degree 15. This blue line has a zero value for lambda. So with zero value here, this term will not count and we are just minimizing the quadratic error. So if we just minimize the quadratic error, we can see there's a lot of overfitting here. The line goes up and down too much because we allow these coefficients to be as high as they need to be to fit the data. But if we add a bit of regularization, for instance, lambda 0.1, we have this green line here and it becomes a lot smoother with less uh, curving up and down. 
because now we are penalizing uh, coefficients that are too large. All the coefficients will tend to be pushed towards zero and the line becomes, becomes simpler. Note here that we increase the training error. You cannot pro you probably cannot see this, but it goes from uh, 0 0.0019 to 0 0.0082. And then the test error, the, the error outside the, the, the training set, drops from uh, millions to 0 0.2, because it was very high because of this, uh, this curving here. And now we can keep doing that. We can keep increasing lambda and get uh, curves that are uh, uh, smoother and smoother with less, with less curving. But at some point, we are not only increasing the training error, but also increasing the, the test error. So there is an optimum value here for lambda that we can also find by uh, using the validation set to optimize the lambda value. Let's see this with a, with a more... Uh, uh, concrete example. I'm going to use data from this, uh, this site, Index Mundi, that has uh, development indices for, for different countries. And I'm going to use data uh, from uh, gross domestic product and life expectancy. So we're going to see how life expectancy changes uh, as a function of gross domestic product for different countries. And this is the data that we have. So this uh, vertical axis here is life expectancy, the horizontal one is gross domestic product per capita. So here we have this data and we want to find a good model for this data, for how the, the values are related. One practical problem is that the, the scales of these uh, variables are very different. We have things changing here from 30 to 80 years of life expectancy or 90. And then we have the gross domestic product per capita going from close to zero to $50,000. So we need to uh, try to adjust the scales of these values in order to prevent problems like numerical instability when we're trying to minimize the error or the, the, si the relative sizes of the parameters and so forth. So remember that when you're using the computer, you're not using real numbers, you're using uh, approximations of real numbers with limited uh, precision. So if you have very different uh, ranges of magnitude in your values, and this is especially true if you are dealing with models that have, say, something raised to the fifth power or to the tenth power or something like that, then it can be very hard to get reproducible results or even results that make sense if you have problems with numerical instability. So in general, it's a good idea to try to rescale everything to uh, approximately the same scale. Of course, sometimes it's not, because if you have something that is measured in, uh, say, in meters or something like that, and some dimensions are actually longer than the other, you should not distort your, your distances. But in general, when you're comparing something like years and dollars, it makes sense to bring everything approximately to the same scale. We're going to see in the next lecture uh, how to rescale things a bit, m a bit better, but uh, for now we're going to rescale everything between 0 and 1. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to import the NumPy library. You're going to do this also in the, in the tutorials, but basically in Python uh, when we want to use something you can, you can import it by using this import command. Uh, and this is useful because the NumPy library has functions like this, load from a text file, that uh, can read a text file with numerical data and give you a metric, uh, an array, an NumPy array with all the data. So we don't need to parse the, uh, the file ourselves. Usually we put the import at the top of our source code, all the imports, so it's easier to see which, which uh, libraries we are depending on. And now we, we can rescale our data simply by uh, asking for the maximum value for our data along the first axis. So if this is something that you don't need to memorize now, but uh, you can experiment in practice. Uh, Python has a lot of these uh, utilities that make it easier to do these operations with very little code. But you need to practice a bit so it's easier to understand. But the idea here is that data is a metric, so you have a number of lines and, and uh, two columns in this case. And you, when you ask for the maximum along the first direction, which is the line, then you get a, a, a vector of two values with corresponding to the two columns with the maximum of each column. And now you can simply divide your data by the maximum 
and this will be broadcast to all the metrics. So your matrix has n lines and two columns. You have a vector with two elements, and this is divided line by line. So for every line, each line is divided by the, the two values. So in this way, it's easy to take all the data. It doesn't matter how many columns you have. Uh, it's irrelevant here. You compute all the maximum values and divide everything by the maximum. So you rescale everything to a maximum of one for all the, the different features. Now we want to split this at random uh, over different uh, uh, groups. So, so uh, some points for the training set, some for the validation set, and so on. This is an example of how uh, we can do this. We get this vector uh, by uh, producing a, a list of uh, integers from zero to the number of uh, lines we have in our data. So our data is the, um, the matrix with all the data, this data variable. The shape uh, attribute of this object tells us how many, uh, how many items it has in each direction. The first direction, remember that Python always starts indexing at zero, so the first direction is the line. Shape zero tells us how many lines uh, this matrix has. So here we obtain a, a range of integers from zero to the number of lines in the matrix minus one. This range, uh, the uh, A range function, will stop at the, the, the last element uh, at the value we give it minus one precisely because it's used for indexing arrays. So it, goes, it has the same number of elements as we specify here, only it starts at zero. <coughs> now we're going to shuffle this vector. So we, we uh, put it everything out of, of order at random. And now we're going to put in the training set, we're going to compare each of the, these uh, randomized values, so the, ra the values are all 0, 1, 2, and so forth, but they are in random position, and we are going to uh, compare with uh, the number of points that we want to put in, each, uh, in this uh, uh, set. And all those that are higher than the points, uh, the number of points we want go to one set, all those that uh, fall below we put in the next set. So basically, we are shuffling all these values and we are splitting into two sets. And we can use this function to split our data at random uh, in different sets. Note that the indexing here is Boolean. So if you have uh, a comparison between one vector with n elements and one number, it will give you a vector with uh, uh, n Boolean values. Those that, uh, for the, which the comparison are true are true. Those for which it's false are false. And you can index the rows, for example, on our matrix with an array of Boolean values that has the same number of elements as the number of rows in our matrix. So what we're saying here is that we want all the rows for which this is true uh, and all the columns at each row. So the, the two points there mean that we want all the columns. If we had a number, we could pick a specific column. And then the same thing here for all the other rows. So basically, uh, sorry. basically, we have here, uh, this is what the code would look like. We put the import directions first, then we spec uh, define the function, we load the data, we rescale everything, and now we create this training, validation, and test set by splitting uh, 90 points for training, 45 for validation, 45 for test. And now we can try to uh, find the best model for, uh, for fitting this data. So we're going to compute the quadratic error given the data and the set of coefficients for the polynomial fitting. We use the, the polyval function from NumPy to evaluate the polynomial with these coefficients on the first column of our data. So the first column of our data is GDP, is the x value. And now we want to predict the uh, life expectancy. So this is the result from the polynomial, the uh, curve for all those points, and we compute the error as the mean of the quadratic difference between the, the values that we have in our data for the, the life expectancy and the predicted values we got from the polynomial. So given some polynomial model, we can input into that function and obtain the average quadratic error. And now, 
we can uh, do this in a loop by changing the, the degree of the polynomial, fitting the polynomial to the training set, and then measuring the error on the validation set. So we are using the training set to fit the coefficient, and then we measure the quadratic error on the validation set. And now we see if we obtain a validation error lower than the best one so far. So we do this for all the, the, the degrees of the polynomials that we want, and we keep always the best coefficients and the best degrees. So by the end, we have found the best model, the, the best uh, uh, polynomial degree for this data by finding the one that minimizes the validation set. Of course, now we need uh, to have uh, another set of points to obtain an unbiased estimate of the true error, because since we are using the validation error to choose the, the best model, now we need another set of points because that one becomes biased, that uh, error value. And this is what we do here. This test set we split it apart in the beginning, but we never used it for anything. Only at the end, when we already decided which is the best model, we use the test set to predict or to get an estimate that is not biased of the true error. <coughs> and this is what we can see here. So these are the different uh, polynomial degrees, uh, the training and validation error. And we can find that the, the with degree 3, we have the lowest validation error in this case. Of course, remember that if we run this uh, different times, since we are splitting the training points, training validation and test points at random, we get different results. So uh, this is, uh, there is a bit of randomness here depending on how we, we split the data. But this is just for this example, we have the training set here in blue, the validation set in green, and the test set in red, and uh, the best line would be this red one that we find here. So, uh, one thing that we can think now is that since this depends on how we split the data, maybe we should do different splits between training and validation and then average them out. And this is actually a better way of trying to validate, of trying to find the best model. Instead of doing one validation, we do several validations with different splits between training and validation. Remember, however, that the test set is always left uh, outside because we cannot use those points. If we do, if we use them to, to decide anything, then the error we can measure with those points will no longer be unbiased. So we're going to see next week how we can do this, uh, these changes uh, in to, to obtain several samples of the validation sets and to average them out. But now we're going to look at regularization. So the difference here is that uh, what we did before was model selection. We were experimenting with different hypothesis class. One hypothesis class was all straight lines. The other was all polynomials of degree 2 and so forth. We represent each of these hypotheses class by a model, so we talk about model selection uh, in this case. And we are using the validation error to select the best model, the one that gives us a lowest validation error. Note that we cannot use the training error to select the best model because the training error tends to decrease anyways as we increase the power of the model, because the training error is measured on the same point that we are using to adjust the coefficients of the model. So that one is not very useful to uh, determine which model to use. So here we are selecting the model using the validation error. Now we're going to do something different, which is regularization. We, we have always the same model, but there we add something to the function that we're minimizing in order to try to shift the way the parameters are found. So in this case, using ridge regression, we add this term here that penalizes the function we're trying to minimize with the squared values of the parameters. This means that we are both trying to minimize the quadratic error and the size of the parameters. Trying to force the model, as long as it doesn't increase the error too much, the model will be forced to have a smoother curve and not, not serve as much. So in practice, we're going to use this ridge regression class. I'm not going to, to implement this here. Uh, However, the ridge class for ridge regression is a linear model, 
So we have to use that trick we saw last week, where we expand our data to include all those non-linear combinations. So in this case, we have the value for the GDP. We're going to add the GDP squared, the GDP cubed, and so forth. We have a non-linear expansion of our data. And then we use bridge regression, which is linear there. And this ends up being the same as using a polynomial regression. So this is what we need to uh, do, expand our data. Basically, we have this uh, data matrix that has one line for each country and the two columns for GDP and uh, life expectancy. And we uh, specify to this function what is the degree of expansion we want. So the degree is how, uh, what's the, the power of the, the value of the GDP we want to add uh, for our matrix. We create uh, our new matrix with uh, the same number of lines as the original one. So this is the shape zero of data. And the number of columns is 1 plus the degree that we're going to, uh, to expand to. We're going to copy the original values, so the ones in the first column. We're going to copy to the first column of the expanded matrix. We're going to copy to the last column of the expanded matrix the Y values, so in this case the life expectancy. Notice that you can index the last element or counting from the last in Python by using the minus, the, the negative index. So minus one is the last one, minus two is the one before last, and so forth. So this, what we're saying here, is that all the rows and the last column of the expanded matrix will get a copy from all the rows and the last column of the original data. So we put on the last column the, the Ipsum values, the ones we want to predict. On the first column, the original values. And now we loop through all the degrees that we want and uh, insert into each column the original data raised to that power. So the second column will have the original data raised to the power of 2, the third column to the power of 3, and so forth. And this way, we do this polynomial expansion of the original data. And now what we do here is we load the data, we rescale everything, we expand to a degree of 10, and now we split this matrix into training, validation, and, and test. And now we're going to explore different uh, uh, values of lambda. And we, uh, we are going to use ridge regression. With this alpha parameter for ridge regression is the, the lambda we are used in that, that equation. This is a specification of the numerical solver. You don't need you to memorize this, but at any time when you're using, you can, uh, you can look at the documentation online, and it will tell you uh, the recommended, uh, recommended solvers and what the parameters are and so on. For now, the only thing I would point out is that in Python, you can uh, specify the, the arguments for the function by the position, as, as usual. You're probably used to that. But you can also specify them by name. And this is useful when you have uh, functions or methods that can receive lots of, of uh, different arguments. So they have lots of parameters, but you want to uh, retain all the defaults on almost all of them and only change a few. So in this case, uh, typically, uh, the, the, for instance, in this case, the constructor for the ridge uh, regressor will have a lot of different parameters. We want the defaults on everything, and we only want to change these three. So we specify the name. Yes. Uh, no, the order, when you're specifying by name, the order does not matter, except that you cannot specify any, one by any parameter by position after specifying one by name. So you can start specifying by position. As soon as you specify one by name, from then on, all must be specified by name. Otherwise, uh, the, the interpreter will not know which one they correspond to. So, but when you specify by name, the order doesn't matter. So you don't need to know the order there. You just need to know which parameters you want to change. So now we're going to fit with the training set. Uh, so we're fitting with our training data. And we are using as the x values all the columns, all the rows, and all the columns except the last one. So this is another useful notation. We start from the beginning, but we stop before the last one. And as the epsilon value, the one we're trying to predict, we are going to use all the rows and the last column. The last column has the life expectancy value, which is what we want to predict. So we are going to fit uh, our solver to the training set. 
and we're going to predict the value for the validation set. So we are fitting with one set and then predicting the life expectancy for the ones in validation. And we're going to compute the mean, the mean of the squared errors between the real value and the one the, the ridge regression model predicted. And now we're going to loop this for all the lambda values and we retain the best one like we, we did before. So we get something like this, if we plot the chart. If we use a lambda that is very low, we have overfitting, and so the validation error is high. If we start increasing the lambda a bit, then we get here this, this sweet spot where we minimize the validation error. But then if we exaggerate on the lambda, if we give too much weight to the size of the parameters, the model won't be able to fit so well, and so uh, we start having increased validation error again. So this way we can decide which is the best uh, value for regularization and now we can do this. This is a, a fit with uh, a degree 10 polynomial so the degree is very high. It, there would be a lot of overfitting if we did not use regularization but since we use regularization we have this smoother curve. It does not oscillate so much and we fit the, the data better. <coughs> so to sum up for this first half we saw that we can obtain estimates of, of the true error in a stochastic way by using a random sample of the points that would be outside our training set. So the training error is not uh, an estimate, it's the actual error we are measuring on the training set because it refers only to the training set. The validation error and the test error also are not estimates because they are uh, measured on the validation set and on the test set. But the test error is an estimate of the true error. And that one, in the end, is the one we really would like to know because the, the error that matters here is the one that measures how well our, our system will work when we apply it to new data points. So remember that the test error can give us an estimate of the true error and that estimate is unbiased as long as we don't use that error for anything. Because uh, uh, if we use the error to try to obtain something that minimizes it, for instance, now we are biasing the estimate and we are no longer having an unbiased estimate. So typically what we do is we use the training set and the training error, uh, we minimize the training error to uh, adjust the parameters of the model. Because we are minimizing that error, it does not give us a good idea of what the true error will be. We use a validation uh, set outside the training set to compare the different models. Remember that if we use the training error then it will not be very useful because the training error tends to, to uh, diminish as we increase the power of the model. But the validation error is more useful and it allows us to detect overfitting. So we use the validation error to select the best model and then in the end after we do everything those test points that we retained outside can be used to get an unbiased estimate of the true error. We also saw two different ways of trying to solve uh, um, the overfitting problem. One is selecting the best model. We use the validation set to compare the different models that pick the one which reduces the validation error. Or we can use regularization. In regularization we are changing the objective function, changing the way we train the parameters more, more generally because we can do that in different ways. And uh, with that change, we reduce overfitting. And, and we can also find the best parameters for regularization using uh, the validation set. So there are some things here <coughs> that, you can, uh, that I recommend that you read, aside from the lecture notes, uh, this section of Bishop, of Biden, and there are some examples in the uh, scikit-learn library. By the way, the, the scikit-learn documentation has lots of examples of uh, many of the things we are uh, uh, working on here on this course, so it's useful if you uh, take a look and try out the tutorials and so on. Okay. So we have time for questions if you want. <coughs>